funny right now. Are you ready for the onslaught of wizard wizard <laughs> of winter blizzard that's happening tonight? Are you ready for the wizards? Well, it's funny you say that because Jared did say it was Ooh. witching season the other day. I don't really know what he no, meant by that. it's literally, like, all of our snow is almost melted. The sun is shining. It looks like I could just go for a nice walk, and we're supposed to get eight inches of snow tonight. Ask me how I feel about no, it. No, absolutely not. I'm livid. Absolutely not. I uh, So, it's, okay, here's the thing. I like snow. I don't mind it being cold. But if you're going to do this 70, 25, 70, negative five, mm -mm. like, that's literally no. what we've been pick, having. Pick a lane. Mm -hmm. Pick a lane. Know your niche weather. Pick a lane. Pick one. Stick. You could, the weather could I don't, I just to listen to our message today. <laughs> I know. Okay, so you know what makes me, I'm, I've been thinking about what we're going to talk about today and like blast from the past and all the things. And uh, so one of our old clients was a salsa company and I'm over here having like a morning grieving session because y'all oh, I can't yes. eat tomatoes anymore I forgot how did you forget I I literally I, every day it's a problem I'm every day sad for you. I currently have I rashes know. on my feet because I ate tomatoes mm, three days ago like uh, yes, absolutely. I almost died. You just missed it. I, 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 it was, it was, I was moments away from begging oh, to no. go to the hospital. That's how bad it was. So I, I am in the process of, by the time you listen to this episode, I should have an EpiPen in my possession for emergencies. Um, but I have been told I should probably not try to reintroduce tomatoes oh. maybe ever so. well if any um you know holistic nutritionists are listening and can get abby back on the tomato train safely please message her i miss i can't even tomatoes I, are it is i didn't realize how much it would affect me i cried <laughs> in the shower because oh no Sorry. okay so one of my favorite all-time recipes favorite all-time recipes for my grandmother is her tomato basil pie which is not it's not a thing that is really made in the midwest apparently it's a southern dish i didn't know this until i was trying to compare contrast recipes because i was just curious if other people even made this thing but i will never have another slice of never my favorite never. pie on the planet our bodies are crazy and change often and maybe someone can true. help you tackle this be be the tomato optimist <sighs> Okay. I believe in it for you. I, <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, have you, did you finish your Netflix book? I haven't finished it, but it's been a really incredible, like continue mm -hmm. to get new nuggets. Well, I and, love the, um, uh, this my... is an exercise you guys can do too. I love part of the conversation that you brought to our leadership meeting last week was really just about yeah. like, Okay, here are the decisions that Netflix made at various stages of their business when honestly it seemed like every odd was against them and everything was stacked like not yeah. in their favor. And here's what they went all in on. And then here are the results and here's what they tweaked and here's what they did. And so what did you say? Oh, the your idea, and this got me brainstorming. And I love things like this of just like quick exercises you can do with your team, even if the answers don't come right there. The question still lingering in the back of the brain. And it was the concept of like, okay, Netflix decided to try multiple tweaks to one thing. And I, everyone always says like, only tweak one thing at a time so you can measure it. And I'm generally in that camp, like truthfully. However, when it was kind of like, we don't have it, we have everything to lose but and nothing to lose kind of thing. So it's like, why not try all the things mm -hmm. we think might work? And so it's seemingly in, you can really only tell this by like looking back seeing how successful Netflix is today, like that definitely helps. But it was like, they tweaked and changed it's like seven different things if, as part of their process and their membership to hope that it would like be enough to kind of be this brand new out of the box, new way in so many different areas that obviously it like it worked and they crushed it. And so the question was kind of like, okay, 
if we've been thinking about our own messaging, our own products, our own offers, or whatever it might be, something as tiny as an opt-in or as big as like an entire membership, what doesn't matter. What are the things you think that you want to try and you only really want to try one of them, but could we try like five things and make it just like something super cool and, and unique? Yeah, because uh, the thing that I kind of leaned into with that is I think for them, the secret sauce yes. was in the combination of instead of the individualized yes. things. And so what's the combination? It's sort of it goes back to that like uh -huh. perfect recipe thing like the, it individual ingredients are only so great. But when you put them all together, then it's like an explosion and it's really fantastic. And so I I, I love pulling out the little nuggets like that. Um there is this one recently, which was, I, I, as the, as the owner of this company, the co-founder of this company, what I was really <laughs> taken aback in this part of the book. Um, Cause the, the guy who wrote it, it was, I wouldn't say it was his concept. Obviously he had a team around him. Like, so it was like definitely developed together, but his original partner wasn't a working partner so his original partner was uh, a cash partner and so his person the person was funding the idea but he was the one mm -hmm. moving the baby forward and like continuing to really go all in on it and his <laughs> exactly and his business partner basically gave him an ultimatum and said, I don't think you're fit to run this company yeah. by yourself. And he was like, I know I've been funding you, but I need I need to play a bigger role in how we move forward. And um, and as such, I need some of your shares. And I was like, <gasps> what the fuck? <laughs> So I was just like, I don't know, not that anything in particular is happening in our business, but I just, it, it was surprising because obviously hindsight's always twenty twenty. but he was saying he was willing to be incredibly transparent with me to the point of like, I didn't even want to hear it because it, it hurt to hear the truth. And I'm like, ew, like, I, you never want to be in a position in your business where it hurts to hear the truth. But I, there's 100% been times in the business where it hurt to hear the truth, but it was so necessary. And so, you know, just it gets you thinking and, and gets you, you know, questioning. I never want to assume I'm not the right person to be in charge. But it, sometimes when you're floundering through it all you're like oh would it help to have someone else come in and run this thing and oh you if you I haven't say, heard the podcast about you. me ranting on this <laughs> I have no I am not suggesting and that, that's the thing is he didn't give up right running it he just decided to let other voices be well, more significant and, and like do it in I collaboration about, I mean we've been 50 50 partners since the beginning and so we've had collaboration literally since day one but we've also built I feel like a really unique culture within our team of collaboration as well and I was having this discussion mm -hmm. with a teammate um I pretty sure in one of their reviews and like 60 day or something like that and I was saying something like, no, it was a 30 day review. Anyways, I was saying something about, you know, they were leaning a lot into perfectionism and wanting to work on it in a silo and then present it to the team. Ideally in the dream world, it's like 99.9% .9 there. And it's like, so perfect. It's so done. It's so right. good. And I was just like, LOL, none of us do that. <laughs> so, um, we all of us have such unique skill sets and bring such a unique perspective to nearly every single thing that goes out the door. And we pride ourselves on on bringing everyone's expertise to what you all see in in the show, in the company, in our content, in our programs, everywhere. That there is not one thing I can think of, not one thing that has gone out or goes out without someone else's eyeballs or perspective on it. And whether that be like they created 
someone else created the template and the other person fulfills it or someone created the canned response and then this person fulfills it. There has been at least two hands on every single thing in this entire company. So I was like, eh, don't stress getting it 99.9. That's not what we do around here. <laughs> No, it, it's not. And it, I don't, I think having a building a culture of collaboration mm -hmm. is so huge. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just been really fascinated well, by this. Speaking book, so. of collaboration, uh, I'm going to move us into housekeeping. And this is a, I think I'm going to start being it. the queen of, was that a great segue or no, <laughs> but here we go. Speaking of collaboration, <laughs> we are coming together with hopefully you, but our entire team and some kick-ass clients for the freedom conference. And it's starting literally yeah. next week. Like today, if you're listening to this on March 22nd, it is starting March 29th, which is next Tuesday, next week. It's going to be incredible. And I hope you've snagged your ticket. Like you need to get on it and, and grab it right now. It's only 47 bucks and it gets you access to our one day event where we're having four sessions spread out over the course of the day that are going to absolutely inspire you, reignite any sort of doubt, burnout, confusion, overwhelm that you've got going on in your service-based business. So we're taking you through the journey of finally deciding to build life first and what does that actually mean and tangibly how do you get there and we're showcasing and hopefully getting you to feel a little bit of camaraderie around the journey that business actually is the natural rhythm and flows of a business so that you can begin to predict and, and see into the future of what's coming your way so you can navigate through it, around it. We can't make every obstacle go away for you. We wouldn't even if we could, because that's not how this works, but we can equip you and arm you with the necessary tools so that you can get through it. And we're segueing into the conversation about pricing, which is like the most scandalous topic in every industry, I feel like. But we're having on one of our amazing clients, Bonnie, who created found, made happen $60,000 in six weeks through existing clients. So we're walking you through the timeline to 60K, the road to 60K, the steps that she took to get there, how we helped her do that, the tweaks that she made, advice that she has for you. That one's going to be a really, really cool thing if you've got existing clients and you're like, come on guys, you owe me more money. That's going to give you the tools on how to actually make that happen. Then we're going into the panel about pricing. So again, continuing the elusive conversation, sexy conversation about money and what to charge and how to charge and how to raise your rates. And what does it look like if I offer my services on a retainer or a one and done or one and done, and then they come back for another one and done. And how is it different across the board, depending on how your service is delivered and how you want to actually grow and scale your business. And then we're finishing the day with perhaps like my favorite conversation, we're going to be walking you through the toxic traits that are happening within your company right now, or could very easily happen if you don't make some small changes. And it's really all about how you can shift from almost being a, a contractor in your own business. You know what I mean? Like service providers kind of like are doing the work all the time and they feel like they're just like coming in and doing the copywriting or doing the design or doing the client management, but they're not sitting in that CEO seat enough because no one really knows how to do it. So we're walking you through what does that process actually look like to shift out of just contractor mindset and being your home contractor into truly leading your company as a CEO. So join us that day. I'm so excited. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> you can grab your tickets Sorry. at bossproject.com slash conference. We would love to see you there. It's going to be such an amazing day. And um, I can't wait to pour into you guys and really get to hear more about your services, the things you're offering, where you're feeling stuck and to help you guys prep. I want to hear from you. Um, myself and our client concierge, Katie, we're in the DMS all the time. Um, so if you can DM us over at boss project, I would love to know, like, what are you feeling right now is your biggest hang up from going into this next season in your business? Are you feeling like you're stuck on money? Are you, um, 
Are you just not sure what it's going to take to go to the next level? Are you feeling like your systems are a mess? Like, what is it specifically? I would love to chat it out and help you kind of start to build a roadmap for yeah. what it and could if you're look out of time like. and money. I really, really encourage you to open up the conversation and start chatting because we're going to help you get clear on what lever then you need to pull in order to free up one of those spaces because that that is a thing. That's what happens. Um, and sometimes it's hard to just when you're in the weeds and you're like doing it every single day to be able to look even 30 days ahead, 90 days ahead. And we really help you see what could happen with just like very small tweaks. We're not talking like a full revamp of your entire business. Okay. So we're super excited. Go send us a DM, go grab your ticket, go start the conversation. Um, are you feeling okay? You doing good over there? <laughs> no, I'm a mess. And I'm like, okay, so normally on a podcast, you can just kind of make it work, which we will, but we're also recording the video. And I think All I have right, an well, eyelash in my, my eye and I get yourself together. Um, so if you're like yes. video, wait, what the heck? We recently started recording these episodes for your viewing pleasure over on YouTube. We know that you guys like to kind of take in content, um, in the way that works best for you. Some of you like to have the video playing in the background and just like watching our silly hand movements and us like really get our message across with our passion is really helpful for you. You maybe play us on your laptop while you're getting some work done. Some of you still like listening on the podcast, you know, as you're going about your day, either way, we've got you covered. We're not going in anywhere on the podcast, wherever you listen to us right now. But if you do want to see our beautiful, shining faces and fresh hair and makeup and sometimes sneezing, then I definitely encourage you to head over to Boss Project's YouTube channel and check us out. Go subscribe, go watch some videos, go share some some takeaways with your friends, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. You ready to dive in? Okay, let's do it. Now, I feel like this feels, have you watched the movie no. Blast from the Past? <laughs> well, that I'm makes sorry. this concept very different. Anytime, I'm gonna just get a spoiler alert to everyone. Anytime you start the sentence with, have you seen the movie and you're asking me, it's probably no. Yeah, I just- Really? I don't know. <sighs> okay, well, the concept is that there, there is an explosion like on this guy's property and, you know, this was back in the time, in the 50s or so, when, like, having a bunker in your own, like, property was more common. And so this family went underground and uh, thinking they're in, like, some kind of, like, nuclear warfare. And so they have to stay underground for a set period of time. Well, they're underground. And then uh, 20, 30, I can't remember how many years goes by. But they, like, raised their son in a bunker. And they have all the food. The whole time. They didn't even think to, like, see what was going on. No, because they were afraid they were going to get radiation. And so they stay down there. And then... Uh, like the the time clock goes off because they like locked themselves in and okay so now maybe radiation is cleared and we can come out blah 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 and so they send their son off into the real world and it's like early 2000s <laughs> now and or whatever I don't remember the time period but like the world is radically different he comes out in this bar he like meets anyway the point of my story is a blast from the past it really feels like we're jetting ourselves mm -hmm. back in time to a time that feels so radically different than where we're at today that I don't even necessarily feel like the same human. But in contrast to that movie, I, I think despite it feeling like so long ago for us, all of the concepts, all of the things we would have done differently, they still apply Absolutely. to today's time. And I think there's this misconception that no. what worked seven years ago is just not going to work today. And that's true. just not um, true. So what we're talking about today is what would we do differently if we were starting over? And I think mm -hmm. I love revisiting this conversation. It's not the first time Abby and I have talked about this, but I think it's a really cool lesson, not only in the sense that things aren't that much different now, but the lessons that I even would say to myself five years ago, seven years ago, whatever, are even sometimes reminders that I need today. And I think oh, those sure. are sometimes the most helpful, crucial lessons because you've technically already learned it. And right now, maybe you just need to be re-reminded or you need another example of how you can get through that lesson. And hopefully this can help you where you're at also and save you a bunch of time and stress and worry. 
Yeah. So to take you back in time, we started as essentially a small marketing boutique. Um, I was doing design and branding and Emily was doing photography. And when we started working together, it meant we created packages of uh, deliverables that really connected all those pieces. So sometimes it was social media content. Emily was taking photos and stock images for brands. Um, Other times we were delivering website design and incorporating like full on shoots, like lifestyle shoots for the brands we were working with. And instead of using paid stock photography, we were including images that made it just elevated it to a whole nother level. And we revisited one of those sites this morning. (laughs) We, we invented branded (laughs) photography. I, you know, Oh no, no, we didn't, but this was definitely in the, I would say early days of that being more common. Um, and (laughs) yeah, it was a while ago. Um, but we were serving local small businesses primarily um, in both the Kansas City market and the Tulsa market. Um, definitely more in Kansas City, but it was it was a really interesting time, and I miss it. Yeah, I so definitely nice. miss aspects of it. And I think, you know, I think the cool exercise here is to look back and kind of pretend we have that same business for a second what are the shifts that we could have taken differently to avoid the burnout, avoid the burning it to the ground and starting over. And it's not that we don't love what we have now that don't read into that. I freaking love what we have now. And I think it, and we've said this before, it would be a much different version if we were to try to start the business we have today right now and try to replicate it exactly as is. It'd be really, really 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 difficult. If I were starting over today, this is the way yes. I would do it today because I I literally couldn't make the business exactly. I have today anymore. Like the no, nope. I just don't think it would cost yep. a lot of the money. Type of business that we and had this or that we would start today, easy breezy. Not that it's easy to do that business, but it's it's a no business model that is not going out right now. Like it's not. It's a, it's a service providing model in a much more intimate done for you localized way. Um, doesn't mean you can't travel to, to handle clients, but it's almost like you have a brick and mortar that you work out of kind of thing. So, yeah. So that kind of goes into the first point of if we were starting over, we definitely would have kept more done for you services. And now this is definitely something over the course of the years, even as we've shifted our model where I feel like maybe once every year and a half, Abby and I are like, should we integrate done for you services again? Like, is there a way that we should try to work that into how we're even doing stuff right now? And we, I'm not going to say never, because I have learned that <laughs> for sure. But it, it's, it's a little bit bigger shift and pivot uh, if we were to introduce it now versus if we would have just kept honing that back in the day. Sure. Sure, uh, for sure. But I, I definitely think in terms of creating profit yes. and margin um, and having more control yeah. over that, so much simpler with services in the one to many model. A lot of your costs mm-hmm. is variable and, and it's out of your control. And like so, with done for you services, if you woke up tomorrow and you're like, you can, you can create not consistency, only consistency for sure, but you can also deliberately to be decide to be like, Hey, I want to make extra cash next month or in three months or whatever. Yeah. You can and throttle you up and so down much more as control you need. over that than anything. Like we were literally just chatting with a client yesterday who was like, Oh shit, I like throttled and made all my goals. And now I'm like, good. So I'm going to build the back end of my business and I'm going to work on my culture and my teams and my systems because I have cushion now to make that happen. Instead of feeling like, you know, if you're a service provider who feels like, okay, but it's the done for you services that are taking all of my time, but I need more time to get more clients because I need more money. We need to talk. So send us a DM over on Instagram. Yeah. I I think there's a, there's a cycle that you can get into where it can feel like that's, there's no way out and that you have to do something totally different. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true at all. Like 
we'd we'd absolutely rather edit and tweak than continue to watch you guys painfully Start throw over. away yep. sometimes decades yep. worth of experience and try to start over with something new. It's it's very painful to watch from the sidelines. And I think other people would probably say the same thing about us. Like <laughs> I I don't I don't say this lightly because I but truly I am a fantastic designer and you are a brilliant photographer and that's not Right. That hasn't changed. I would need to I would need to probably get a camera strap for my wrist because my wrist is super weak these days. I don't know if I could hold yeah, it. Yeah, I, I mean we would need to make some accommodations based on our That's what we were bodies. About earlier, doing our like, styled shoots and the work it took to make that shoot come to have like the physical labor. And we were both like, Oh, we would need to hire like movers. <laughs> like we're just yeah, the if we were to go back and do some of the services, like literally we would need more assistance. We would need and when I say assistance, I don't necessarily mean like an assistant. Body. I mean like literal Muscle. muscles yeah. and bodies. Cause some of the stuff some of the work we were doing, like yeah, a workout. Yeah. It was a workout. Um, okay, so I want to hear your thoughts. I kind of, I kind of want us to both very quickly give our own versions of pros and cons into this next thing. And this next thing is sure. also one of those things I feel like comes up every once a year, year and a half as like a, should we, or should we have, or would this work? And the idea is, is shifting into more of a firm or an agency type model. Mm-hmm. So I think this is a really natural next step for service providers um, and can really be an interesting way to scale that allows you to avoid burnout because you can build a team around you that is skilled and talented and can help you on the deliverable side. And if you decide to, I mean, you can still be in involved in client deliverables if you want to be. But with an agency model, you do have the opportunity to move more into mm -hmm. strategy only or management only. Um, and I think for a lot of business owners, like once you've been doing the creative thought work for so long, sometimes you can get you can start to get in a bur burnout cycle. But if you, if you can focus on being creative and like using your mind in a different way, it, in my opinion, it's not as exhausting. Now, are there cons? A hundred percent. You know, I think sometimes I've seen people try to scale this up too fast and it's really hard to quality control your work at that point. If you're hiring people, like, are they going to represent the way you would do something? Are they going to talk to your clients the way you would talk to your clients? There's definitely an aspect of that, that, that can feel scary. Um, cause you're, you're allowing other people to represent you in a much bigger way. Um, I also can see sometimes if you do this inappropriately, I've seen people struggle with what is the pricing threshold that is still achievable for the clients I want to work with, but the price I need to charge to support the team yeah. that I have, like sometimes the pricing versus team, it can start to get a little like, Ooh, I don't know. Like this right. is pretty premium. Um, not that I think that's a bad thing, but I, I think there's some, there's some definite like struggles that yeah. can come up with that. Um, but if you are looking to scale yeah. and you're in the services realm, agency versus it do. And I think my biggest hesitation had has been because I'm starting to learn this skill a little bit more. But if you had asked me even maybe six or eight months ago, I probably would have been like, no, because of this hesitation. And it's more so the fact of like having that big of a team or be responsible for that many people and really making sure. I, I enjoy working agree. with people a lot That's more what than I, mean. I think like, I realized. Eight months ago, I'd have been like, I don't want to do that. And so that means I would have to do all the, the work myself and grow it. But I'm now seeing that I am really capable actually of figuring that out and it feels fun again um, but I do want to give you a resource if you are a service-based business owner 
even if you're not going to do it, but if you've entertained the idea of what, what could it look like to have an agency? There's this book. I'm holding it up on our video. It's called Built to Sell by John Warlio, maybe is how you say it. <laughs> you can find it on Amazon. <laughs> and don't let the title fool you. You do not have to have any desire to sell your business to get amazing takeaways from this book. I read this book for the first time probably three or four years ago, and it drastically just like made a couple of shifts in my brain about how I think about our services, our offers, and our company. And if you even think that you might be hiring employees to deliver some of your your client deliverables, this is a really amazing book to start get your getting your headspace in, figuring out your niche and how you frame up your service as a product. It's really about productizing your service because if you go to sell your business, you need something that can be replicated, but it helps you even if you're not doing that. So. Oh, and I have, I have so many thoughts about that mm -hmm. productization aspect. Like I think there's so many things that can be done because I, mm, how do I say this? There's a lot of you out there who are convinced you can't have a team because you think you're really special. <laughs> you And baby, you are really special. But your service isn't. You, you no, it's really not. So you can teach a lot more of that than you realize. Um, and even, even to the point of, I think there's also this misconception that like, okay, maybe you de like design the initial concept. You think other people couldn't model that? There's a way. They can. Yeah. If you hire the right well, people. Not just if you hire they the can. right people. If you if you do the work first to set it up to be able to be yeah, taught that's true. and replicated first, creating the systems around it, communication around it, SOPs and standards. Mm -hmm. There's definitely work. We're not saying that you can just hire someone tomorrow and they'll be able to deliver it like you do. Don't fool yourself. Um, but it is possible. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. this next piece I want to talk about because I think everyone needs to hear it because everyone wants the sexy version of what happened. And it's happened to us a couple times in a couple of different areas. And when it's happening, it's very exciting and it's very fun. And you think it's going to like. And the aftermath is a fucking like shit show. Fix everything and change everything for the better. And there's never going to be a hard no. part after this. <laughs> no. Absolutely so not. Here Absolutely is not. I, and I, this is the lesson I need to learn today too and be reminded of. I will do anything in my power to scale and grow slower with intention so that I have a stable base as I reach the next level rather than seeking growth super fast. Ratcheting up? sounds good trust me it does but i've and i also now here's the thing that i get a little caught up in is is my version of scaling fast the same as someone else's version probably not um and if i had a different experience like, for instance, if I were starting over today, I think I could go from zero to half a million 100%. in a year, and I wouldn't no, think that was too and, fast. And the number, isn't rel the, the number is relative, truly. It, it doesn't actually matter. What I'm talking about is, because when I say it's happened to us multiple times, I, I mean that. Like, it's not just like, oh, when we hit this financial benchmark, and then that only happens once, so you only feel like you scaled fast once. It could be anything no. that, like your version of business viral. And that's how I kind of feel it and view it as it, it's not a public thing necessarily. It could be, but it's like, Oh, all of a sudden all of these things are happening. And on the outside, they're all really positive things. But on the inside, I don't have the system set up. I don't have the communi communication set up. I don't have the lessons learned that I need to have learned in order to be this new version of myself to sustain this. There's so many things that well, have to happen. I think the the part that's probably the hardest yes. is the self, like, are you able to grow yes. fast enough yourself to sustain mm -hmm. the thing? And I think, I think a lot of times, I, so I feel like women tend to put themselves in a box that they have to be mm -hmm. fully equipped to be at a certain stage yeah, or that, they're, or they're actively failing. Promotion when they have like 
sixty percent of the skills or whatever, and women only apply when it's like ninety. No, it's like way less. I think, I think it's like I'm forty or thirty, that up, but it's drastically different. Yeah, and women yes. think they have to have like ninety yeah. or ninety-five percent to apply for a promotion or apply for a new job, and it's like that's mm-hmm. not true. But I do think as women, it's easy to talk yourself out of things because you just don't think mm-hmm. you're ready or you. so. I feel so. all of that to say, yes, I would scale slower because I do think you can build a more stable base. Um, and I feel like my version of slow now is really different than my version of slow five years ago because well, I have more and, knowledge. And so a tangible example, so it like could be like, what does it actually mean to, to scale slower and with intention? And especially for a service-based business, what I mean by that is like, Okay, for example, the client I was bringing up earlier scaled really quickly. Within six weeks, she nearly 2x'd her revenue from the previous year, um, 60K in contracts, and then it ended up being even more than that after she sent it out to new clients, let go of a couple clients, but kept a bunch and then got new ones. And what she could have done was seen how quick and easy, and I put that in air quotes on the video, quick and easy that was. So she could have chosen to keep doing that and like even double what she had already gotten within six weeks. She could have very easily done that. But instead she she took a break and she took a pause and she was like, okay, this feels okay. And I know I can manage this. And now I'm looking ahead and deciding to spend this other time, not getting new leads and a shit ton of more new clients, but doing behind the scenes, building the solid foundation work. And we're helping her do that. So she was able to see it, but that's what I mean. It's like deliberately taking a pause. Yeah. It'd be really easy to be like, oh, I, I was able to get to 15 clients a month. And so right, now I'm going right. to go to 30 and clients a month and like, the people, and maybe systems, you can, the process is built up to sustain that. Yeah. And you might be able to, some of you might be able yeah. to get the sales, but the then like the, on the fulfillment side, mm-hmm. you're floundering because you don't have the project management in place. You don't have the like yep. team to support that many and people. And our version or, of that for the one literal mini time. was choosing to continue to scale, but like, oh shit, more, more students, more members, more clients means we need more customer service, means we need more responses, means we're going to have there's just so many different things that you have to then create a system or a job for, and then to hire and do the description, job description, do the interview and then onboard and train. And like, there are so many things that need to happen with just one decision. And I don't think those things are thought of enough in the scaling process, but Mm -hmm. let's talk Mm -hmm. about systems and software. (laughs) Yeah. Systems and software. So systems have always been one of our favorite things. And I, I think part of it comes from like the desire to like to see how things work and how things connect. And even if I'm not the person ultimately doing the thing, I want to know the process. I want to look at that whole thing. Now, I remember early on, Emily would get on to me because she'd be like, why are we still hacking this thing together? There was a system and a process, but it was a really manual or it was very rudimentary. Mm, I mean, it was like using, it was like using yeah. scotch tape to like put stuff together. Like it was like not, <laughs> it was, it was, it was getting a spy. Okay. Um, but a lot of that was not from the willingness to like look at better systems or better software. Uh, it, it came down to finances and thinking, oh, well, if I keep costs mm-hmm. so lean, then that's going to be better for me. And I, I have come to find out that like, there are some things I will no yeah. longer blink an eye. I'm like, I don't even care if it's right. $300 a month, $50. I mean, whatever. It just depends on what it is, but there, there's absolutely things in our business that the system it provides the framework it provides that's already done and you get to just like integrate it into your existing world like I can't imagine operating our business without a project management system without a CRM without without a communication channel that we all use like 
Because ultimately what it comes down to is the transition behind when you first start your business and you're literally doing everything and you are trying to make the most, save the most, keep the most money. But that transition that needs to happen when you start to understand the value of your time and you don't, oh yeah, like you might do the time study of what it takes for you to finish a project for a client or, you know, offboard a client or whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. But are you doing a time study in how long it takes you to hack your bookkeeping or your client management system or your emails or your file management or your notes and really taking a look Mm -hmm. at like a systems audit of where you're spending your time. And I know that we think that the time, the lost time that it takes to find a system, set up the system, create the SOPs or the processes, like is time that you're not getting back, but it literally is. It literally is. Yeah. Yeah. It. <laughs> um, I think you're, sh- I think you would be shocked what will come of you investing into some of these systems. You sent me this comment the other day that like <laughs> really hit the nail on the head for me where someone was essentially talking about like a lot of people tend to blame mm-hmm. systems and software mm-hmm. like a lot of people um and they'll say oh like so and so sucks this software sucks whatever at the but a lot of them aren't willing to do the work to actually set it up to utilize it the way it was intended to be utilized and if you're not willing to invest that upfront time then of course course it's not going to work for you because you're expecting magic to fall out of the air a headache and learning to expect what a software can deliver and nothing else. Like you, there is no one software that does everything. It truly. And no. we have known this from the beginning. We've talked about this from the beginning, whenever we share softwares, like, you know, there's those tools and I'm not even literally thinking of any particular one, but like, especially a couple of years ago when like social media, like scheduling and posting tools became even more popular, like five or six years ago, they tried to be like everything for you, like your content planner and your scheduler and your poster and your searching tool and your this and your that. And like a couple of their features just like freaking sucked. Like they just didn't work. They weren't that great. And a lot of them now have realized to just lean in on what they do really well. But I also encourage you to do that. If like find a software, you don't have to use a hundred percent of the software for it to be effective. You don't, but you need to use and spend enough time mm-hmm. to set it up, to get it working for you because that's literally what a software's job is. Yeah. Well, it's funny you bring that up because uh, apparently the internet needs to learn this lesson more than once. Uh, because in that book, I'm, reading about Netflix's evolution he's talking about the dot-com boom and crash and um basically there was this guys out there that if you were going to be successful in the online world you did have to be everything to everybody so if movies were your industry then you had to be mm-hmm. a community no, and a platform and a content movies, source liver movies yeah great movie mm-hmm. and 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 they were like this isn't mm-hmm. sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> and they're there and the reason the, the reason we feel this way is cuz we are influenced by we there are companies out there that are attempting to be everything for everybody and some of them are doing a decent enough job that you're convinced that you can do it too but you're not Amazon. So mm-hmm. like and you forget that Amazon started yeah. as a bookstore. Well, and store. Amazon also isn't everything. You can't like you you can't grocery plan there. So don't right. no. I could talk about that for days. But speaking of <laughs> niching and getting clean on your messaging and results, yeah. this is a good segue. I again this is one of those on this list that like I need to be reminded of today and probably tomorrow and next month. Um because we've we've had an opportunity so many times to do this and for some reason we've been like ah, like I don't know. <laughs> But it's the mistake of, or what I wish we had done differently, or if I were starting over, here's what I would do. I would not be afraid to go all in on one niche messaging or result that we serve for people, period. It's hard because because a lot of things. (laughs) Well, that's true. You can be good at many things. um, But you also can get in this cycle where 
you're scared to let go of certain products because then you feel like all your eggs are in one basket and you want to diversify. And if I, I want to remind myself of a lesson we learned years ago and we just need to keep this in the back of our minds. Okay. Yes, you do want to diversify your income, but your diversified income doesn't all have to come in the form of your business. And so your business, how you spend your time can be in one clear way, but maybe you also make money on investments. Speaking of my financial advisors, literally calling me right We're busy. Um, <laughs> maybe you make money on investments and that you have a financial planner that like you literally equip with your money to have them go do something with. I, I think we're in this world where we're like, oh, well, we need seven streams of income. And then we think we got to fit them all in the box right. of our business. And I just think that's like, not only is that very hard to do, but unless you have the team that can really focus on these individual things, you're trying to like, you're just trying to do all the things all at once. And I just yeah. don't. Unless, well, the, I don't know. I just think it's really hard. hard. If, if your goal is to make a million dollars, right? Maybe that's what your goal is. Yeah. My brain had told me that has to come from my business. And this was years ago. But the uh, my coach said to me, what if your business isn't the only way you make a million dollars? And it was just like, oh, oh, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a piece of the puzzle. Like you can invest in real estate. You can, you can get outside investments. You could, you can invest in other businesses, but again, not be like actively running them. Like, they're... <laughs> yeah, I, I, oh, so as people are silly, yeah. including us. Okay. And so I, I think it's important that like, okay, my, my, my main thing here is like what happens when you really hone in and you focus on one clear message and one clear result? I think there's so much opportunity to, to grow faster, but in a more right. sustainable way, because you're not creating right. product well, confusion. It's the, it's the um, best way you're, to start to build a business that you actually love, right? Because I feel like every service provider goes through the growing up phase of offering all of the services to all of the types of clients. And then maybe you narrow down your services, but you're still offering it to all the clients or vice versa. And then there's one more growing up phase of like, nope, these are the type of people I want to serve. And this is what I want to offer. And it's that right there that I don't want you to be afraid to go all in on because having clients not book is not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. I we literally had that conversation with someone yesterday. She's like, "Oh well, like my Do my hundred percent close rate uh, conversion rate went screen. down." Yeah, and it was like, I don't, I don't know why we convince ourselves that closing less people is bad when we become more clear on who we're ideal for. When we come become more clear on who's the best fit to work with us because you're creating less headaches on the back end because when you when you're early on and I'm not saying don't do this because I think there is a yeah. time and a space where you do need cash and you you can be more willing to take on a more diverse client pool because you have to learn and experiment like I do think that's a phase that's required like could you go all in early maybe but I do, I do think there takes some experimentation to figure out what are you really good at and what yeah. do you really like doing? And I, until you experiment, you could hypothesize all day long, but I've seen some people attempt to go all in on something that they haven't yeah. actually done before and then they hate it. <laughs> so like I, I would experiment and yeah. then get clear as well, quickly as possible and then be with, like yeah I, I knocked it down to 50 percent, but every time I land a client now it's like two of my old clients because of my prices so it's the same <laughs> but and then she and then she followed it up with it to say well the ones that didn't go for it I really didn't want to work with them anyway and then I was like I'm like I just hope you hear yourself okay I hear you babe I, I hear I heard everything you just said and 
theoretically, the, what I'm hearing is you probably could have made it move forward, but you didn't really want them to move forward. So you put off the energy that yeah. you didn't want them to move forward, whether yeah. you said those words or not. <laughs> okay, so let's go into our last thing that I would be very intentional if I were starting over to if you walk away with nothing else, in my opinion, I really think this is the thing because this is going to cause it's going to come up for you because the way we're taught to work is to work really hard. And so like the odds of you getting to oh, this yeah. point are and, high. And you're going to get to it multiple times because I've, I've had to have this conversation with myself multiple times. I've learned this lesson and I've practiced this, practiced this skill and it begun to really figure out the questions I need to reflect on and ask myself to identify the actual, the cause, and then to make decisions based around that. So the thing that I would do differently and what I'm recommending to you to do today, right now, if you are, especially if you're already in this season of feeling burnout and exhausted and overworked and underpaid and stressed out and hating your clients and hating your work and wanting to change everything, if any of that sounds familiar, I would love for you to, to take a breather and sit for a second and maybe journal out or process out with a friend. I want you to try to identify the actual cause of the burnout, because I promise you, it's not just the fact that you have your own business or that you serve clients or that you're in your niche or your industry or that you offer this certain service. It doesn't necessarily mean it's all of those things combined. It could be maybe just the communication with clients, maybe boundaries, maybe it's your systems. Maybe everything feels like it just drags on and, pro and projects take forever. Maybe it feels like the money isn't there and we need to reevaluate what you're actually offering. Maybe it's the type of people that you're working with, but it's, it's more often than not like just one or two things. Well, and sometimes the burnout is actually, it's showing up in work, but it's coming from yes. other parts of your yeah. life. Like, is the communication in your marriage off? It, it, right. Are your kids stressing you out? Do you have a sick family member? Are you mm -hmm. sick? Mm -hmm. Do you have a chronic illness? Like, is there something else at play here? And are we being really honest about what's aiding right. in the stress? What's aiding in the chaos? What's aiding in the burnout? And I, the common thing I see, and, and I don't know if it's because... I don't know what causes it to happen more often in this group of people, but y'all tend to, when this creeps in, you just want to change everything. And it's, it's sort of like when, when you like walk into your bedroom enough times and you're like, I'm just gonna, I want a new bed frame and I want to repaint the walls and I want to like redecorate and I want to redo the whole thing. And it's just like, and it and sounds you just fun to like would you feel start. <laughs> And, I, and I'm not saying that you don't need to remodel sometimes I, I like it for uh, your business. Like, I'm not saying that's not true, but so often you're like, take it down to the studs or literally rip the whole house out from under you. I've watched people walk away from businesses making multiple six figures and just shutting it all down. A handful of things, created systems, hired over here, restructured the boundaries here, and it would have just, oh yeah, actually, it's just because I feel like, you know, and it's never, it's maybe never this small, right? But this is what I hear a lot from clients, specifically that boundary that they have with their clients and their team or their expectations for when they mm -hmm. think they have to be working mm -hmm. and doing their business. I'm like, what if you just like, I don't know, honored your boundaries for 30 days? Let's like, let's just start there. Well, so the thing I want you to be mindful of, and uh, we got the opportunity to experiment with this, which is, I think has helped illustrate this for us, but some of you don't have this luxury. And so I just want to let you in on a little secret. So a couple of years ago, Emily and I were like, what would happen if we like didn't require ourselves to be full time at Boss Project and we allowed ourselves to experiment with other businesses and there was no conflict there? Like, like you could fully lean into whatever you want. I could fully lean into whatever I want. 
I will tell you that waking up two years later, I didn't want to work that hard. Start starting from scratch is so much more work than I think you guys are realizing. And uh, could I do it? Yes. Could I build another business? I absolutely could. But I promise you, regardless of where you're at or what stage you're at, tweaking something inside an existing system that's even even working 25% or 30%, it's going to feel like, oh, it'd be easier to start over. It's not well, and I think most of the time. What that taught me too is, okay, so, you know, I think for a while, maybe people are kind of segueing out of this language, but for a while, a lot of people were calling themselves not just small business owners, but entrepreneurs, right? I'm a creative entrepreneur. I'm a creative business yeah. owner, whatever, or entrepreneur was in their yeah. language. And the actual like definition or meaning behind what an entrepreneur is, is someone who like is excited about the, the idea of starting and being a part of multiple different ventures, projects, fundraising, whatever, right? And I thought that's who I was. So part of that break, we did like what Abby was talking about. We, we worked on our own projects. We like, we needed our own like independent creative time, I feel like, because we had been so closely yeah. intertwined for so long. And it taught us that we can get our independent creative time in different ways while still focusing just on this thing. And I think we both yes. realized, you know what, maybe I'm not actually an entrepreneur and that's okay. I can be a kick-ass small business owner of my thing, a co-founder of a really cool company that shifts and pivots with the needs of our clients and us and the market and whatever, right? We can, we can tweak this thing. And, and I, I like to think of our business as, as a disco ball, right? We're like, all the facets are a little bit different if you turn it just a little bit, but it's the same core structure. And I was like, I think I finally came to terms with the fact that I'm not actually an entrepreneur and that's okay. And I don't really want to do that. I have no desire to like start another business from scratch tomorrow on the side. I literally don't. That sounds awful to me. <laughs> and so if that's the identity that I don't want, then what does it mean to lean into what I actually want? Yeah. What I like consistent cash what I like time to do things that aren't work and the things that aren't work I do. shocker I don't have to I get paid to say, do uh, what I like um figuring out what it means to have hobbies that I don't get paid to do I don't know what that means yeah if, if you're a, if you're a serial turn your hobby into somehow getting paid even if it sucks like even if the money is terrible you got to stop doing that because the stress you're putting yourself under to not just like enjoy the thing is well, and ask crazy. Yourself, would I still enjoy this thing if I didn't have an opportunity to get paid? And if the answer is no, then that's not a hobby. Yeah, because if the only thing fueling you is the dollars, then it's not about the thing you're doing. Like, I mean, to the point, just to illustrate how often this comes up, it's like, Emily got good at clay earrings and then like I started this thing over here and I I probably had three or four things at various points but even to the point of oh well I could also do this and I could also do that and and I I like to bake I like to cook like maybe I'll write a cookbook mm -hmm. oh my god it was non-stop mm -hmm. and uh, and I uh, sometimes you need a phase where you're just like allowing yourself to yeah, try on all the hats I yeah. get that but I when I realized I could just like bake a loaf of bread and it, I didn't have to take like, a fucking picture well, to share it on Instagram. I about because I love doing okay. DIY projects for our house. I truly love like painting and adding, you know, features to our walls and doing whatever. And in my entre entrepreneur esque brain, has yeah, has you think you have to share it. it the whole process. Told me, like, how can I set this up to get paid? And is there a sponsor for this? Is there a way I could shift my oh. Instagram to be but like, that's where my brain goes. I'm an Enneagram three. That's how I look at nearly everything in my life. Yeah, I was literally giving parent advice to I'm someone yesterday on Instagram and in the voice messages. And I was like, I could write a fucking book on this. Like, could that be like, that's just my I brain. Know. Not that I'm going to explore those things, but that's where my brain immediately goes. And so I've had to learn how to kind of check myself and be like, you can do it for fun. And if you start doing it as a requirement, you're not going to like it. You won't. I know that about myself. And so like, with my living room paint color, for example, I love sharing that on stories and just getting people's like thoughts and feedback and what would you do and whatever. I've 
I already know what I'm going to do. Like, I don't actually care what you like vote or say, but it's really fun having that community conversation. But I'm not doing, I'm not like, hey, Sherwin-Williams, you want to pay for my living room? Because as soon as they pay for my living room, I'm going to feel immediate dread on, I have to take photos of every step of this project and I have to document it and I have to post about it. And I don't want to do any of that part. <laughs> well, and... Uh... The part that I find hard is I do enjoy doing a lot of those things. Um, I do enjoy documenting. I do enjoy the photos. And, you know, there are phases of my life that are just like straight up missing because I was like, sure. I'm just going to put the camera down. And now I don't have the photo and not, like that bothers me. But I just find it interesting that you can, there is a way to mature through this and realize and everyone's end result will be different, but I know for both, I really, I'll just speak for myself. I know for myself, it has meant it's okay to only have yeah. one job. And like, and part of that is an Absolutely. insecurity thing, like a money insecurity thing. Like I was so worried about it all just going poof yep. for some reason that I'm like, I need to create other plans. forms of security for mm -hmm. myself. And I don't, I don't need a backup that plan. Know that we want to do separately and perhaps together also, but for sure separately is write a book. Yep. I agree. I'll probably still write Absolutely. a cookbook at some point. And, and I want to write a business book. I have a, I have a couple of business books up my sleeve, but I, but it, it no longer has become a, well, if, if I could do this, I'm like, no, it, it's going to happen. It's just when, and I'm not worried about the timeline anymore. And it, it's, it's recognizing those pieces about going back to the conversation of burnout, of you forcing things to have to happen because of a fear. That's generally what burnout stems from. And if you actually identify the actual issue that's causing it, can you tweak that? Maybe tweaking it is getting therapy, <laughs> getting coached through it, getting a system in place, whatever it might be is the burnout as big that that's what I want you to really linger on all of this to say if we could go back in time the the short and quick of it is we would we would more than likely be doing a service-based business we probably would have built it agency style we'd have a really clear concise high touch signature service we wouldn't be offering a million a la carte options we'd be really clear on the problem we're solving the people we're talking to we probably would have a pretty local market like we wouldn't be afraid to get some press here and there but like i we wouldn't care if we were only known in our local city for the work we do and we'd both be okay with working and then setting down work and doing fun things on the weekends that are really just about having fun and like filling ourselves up. And like, there's still a part of me that thinks, well, maybe that someday the, all those things will still happen. And like, and a lot of those things, even if we were to start over, blah, 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 what would we do? There are so many aspects of that that yes. we are reincorporating into our existing business model because we see so much yep. value in that. And so I want you to know, even though the way we offer services is a little bit different, we're still modeling a lot of the things we know are like tried and true, will work, long lasting legacy building. We were literally, we pulled up a client website. It has been seven. Yeah. six yeah. or seven years since we built it. I swear to God, it looked like it rolled off the presses last so week good. because it is so, so classic. And if we can do business mm -hmm. that way, like, I don't want to be a flash in the plan. I want to be around a long time. And so, Baby, you're so classic. I'm excited for you. <laughs>